Good morning, everyone. Happy Election Day. If you don't realize, today is the first day of early voting. So you'll see the, the canvas out there, the, the covering. People have already started coming in. So it's like Groundhog Day. It'll be 40 days of election days from now till June 28th. So you may hear me repeat things a few times. I'm going to try to move it along looking at the hour. I don't want to get the wrath of Mr. Kenyon here. But we'll um, don't worry about Mr. Kenyon. <laughs> there may be some questions that you have even after this, if um, that probably could be answered if you had come over to the office and see the process. The nice thing about this right now is we're discussing it. A lot of this stuff is going to be going on in the next few weeks as the ballots start to come back in. Please feel free to come over just like other members of the public will as poll watchers to come and see how it works. We're gonna do a snapshot. We're gonna go through all the safeguards and show you the step-by-step. Step. But when you see it in action, you'll see what we're talking about. And I think it can help. So with that, vote by mail and election security are obviously hot topics. That's why we're talking about it. You hear it on the news, you hear it here. So um, this may seem like commonplace to us, but we want to make sure that the voting public understands what's going on and that they feel secure in what we're doing. The clerk's office has always taken and will continue to take election security very seriously. Ensuring that we have a safe, secure, and transparent election process is important not just to us, but it's also important to the voters and obviously important to you as well. So what we're going to go through is the election security plan and it it summarizes the steps that we have taken in the past and will continue to take in the future. Um, but understand that this does change. Um, the general, we're a creature of the General Assembly. And so anytime the legislature makes changes, we have to implement them. When there's a law, we follow it. Sometimes those laws change before an election. Sometimes they change during an election. But it's our job to make sure that we're responding to those and following them. So what we talk about now may be different before the next election because there may be different laws that have come into effect. A lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, we dealt with in the last election. We did in the last election, but we learned from the last election. We learned from the consolidated election. And so it is an evolving process. Again, that's why it's kind of important for you guys to see it. Understanding election security, especially the vote by mail process, it's important to understand how vote by mail works so you understand the security measures that we're talking about. Uh, we've come to this committee in the past. Um, we've made multiple presentations on vote by mail and election security, but some of you are new to the committee, some of you are new to the board. So I'm gonna highlight just a little bit. We made a, a long step-by-step -step presentation um, before the 2020 general election. Here are just some slides from that presentation. you'll see some of that stuff coming back because the process is still the same. Like I said, it's important to understand vote by mail if we're gonna talk about election security. And one thing to understand about vote by mail is that it's not new. We may be talking about it now as if it's new, but it's really not. It's the same method of voting that voters in Kane County have used for decades. The, the name has changed. You used to hear about absentee voting. Well, it's the same thing. The General Assembly changed the words from absentee voting to vote by mail in 2015. Otherwise, the process is the same. The difference is the numbers. The difference is the number of people who have chosen to vote by mail over the years has increased and really increased mostly in the last few years. I'm not expecting you to see every little number on this chart, but I'll kind of go through it. We go back to, to 1968. All this information is available on our website. So Another part of our transparency initiative is if you want to see election results going way back, if you want to see it broken down by vote by mail, early voting, in-person voting, all that stuff's there. This, this is from our website. So if you go back to 1968, you, you had 2,500 people who voted, quote, absentee. That's what they called it at that point, or vote by mail. So those numbers, you know, depending on the election, obviously less people vote in a consolidated, more people vote in a general um, but those numbers have been were consistent for several decades. 
you know, two, three thousand, four thousand that voted at that point by mail in a general election. You got um, you hit about eight thousand in two thousand four. You stayed in the four or five thousand in general elections. Numbers went up to about eight thousand in twenty sixteen. In 2018, we had a little under 15,000, and then the number obviously increased significantly in 2020. Whether that was just due to the pandemic or that was a decision of voters to continue down that road, we'll see in these next elections coming up. Oops. So this chart, again, I'm not going to, you're not going to see every step and I'm not asking you to read everything. We're going to break down each step in the process, but we took the whole from the beginning, from the ballot creation to ballot storage and broke it down into eight steps. And then each of those little pieces on the flow chart are sub steps. And we thought that it's easier to digest when you're looking at it step by step to simplify it and also to help educate. If we want people to understand what we're doing, we need to be able to explain it in an easy digestible process. And the color coding, we'll get to a little bit more, but the color coding also helps you understand what's happening at that point um, in each stage in the process. There, the, color, the colors here correspond to colors in the secure area where all of the processing is going on. We'll show you. But when something's orange, that's the orange section. Those are the things that are happening in the orange section. So people can look and see, oh, Orange is ballot creation. That's all happening here. That's what they're doing. You'll hear that again and again throughout the process. So the first step is ballot creation. You see the flow chart. And so each of those steps we're gonna talk about here in the subsequent slides. So this is the beginning. The first step is that the voter fills out the vote by mail application. So one, we've talked about it before, one little change, state law changed last year now a voter can apply for what they call a permanent vote by mail status. So if that voter chooses to request vote by mail ballots for multiple elections, not just one election, that's allowed under state law. One security safeguard that our office has taken is that anyone who wants to request that permanent vote by mail status needs to fill out the application on paper. So we have that wet signature rather than just through the online portal. Not that the online portal isn't secure, but if you're going to have that kind of request for future elections, we wanna have a record with your signature to go in your voter registration file for the voter's protection. And you know, again, it's a security measure, but the online portal is still available for anyone that wants to request a ballot for just one election at a time. So step two is that once that request comes in, the elections department confirms that the applicant is actually a registered voter. So using our voter registration database, you may see references to VRS in this presentation, which stands for voter registration system or DFM or EIMS, which is the vendor. Um, so those things may come up, but basically, so the voter requests the, the ballot and then our voter registration database goes to check, is that person a registered voter? So without getting into some of the wild theories we hear out there, just keep in mind, only registered voters are in the voter registration database. Only someone who completes an application who is already a registered voter can request a ballot. So no one who is not registered to vote can request a vote by mail ballot. That person won't be in our system, thus there won't be an entry, thus, a ballot can't be mailed to that person. So we verified that the person is registered, the person sent in the application, and then the process starts where the ballot is printed. Another thing you're gonna hear me say over and over again, anytime ballots are being handled, processed, tabulated, verified, whatever you wanna call it, anytime a ballot is out, you have at least one team of a Democrat and a Republican judge there. So you're going to have a bipartisan team or teams reviewing every step of the process. One thing you'll also see, uh, we'll, we'll get into the, the cameras and those things, the judges, um, besides their little badges, which sometimes are hard to see, 
we have vests. So the Democratic judges will have a blue vest with a D on the back. The Republican judges will have a red vest with an R on the back. So if you're over there and you see these people, okay, uh, yeah, okay, they're, they're doing something. They're in the orange section or the blue section. I see a blue and a red uh, vest. Okay, great. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Move on. Again, more levels of security and safeguards throughout the process. So a little highlight on some of the equipment. This is the folding machine. So we bought this folding machine prior to the 2020 election. It folds. Fun, nice name for it. So the ballot actually brought us, let me skip ahead, sorry. This is actually the printer. We'll start with the printer. The printer prints the ballots. Um, by having the printer in-house, it's another security measure. So we're not sending ballots out to a third-party vendor. We're doing them in-house. So everything stays here. Obviously, it's more secure. If, you know, in the past, we've had to go out before we have the printer, but it's another layer of making things better. Sorry, we'll go back to the folding machine. Ballots been printed, now it goes to the folder. The, because of our language requirements, having to have ballots in English and Spanish, um, we use that larger paper. If you've ever requested a ballot, you'll notice it's long. Um, what we learned in the last election cycle was if you take that ballot and you fold it twice instead of once, instead of being in a giant envelope, it goes to a smaller envelope. We saved $1.50 in postage per envelope. In the last election, we had over 90,000 that went out. We had you know, 80,000 that came back. So do your math, we, um, we saved more than $200,000 with that extra fold for a $15,000 machine. Sounds like good math to me. So ballots been printed, ballots been folded, and then on the outside of the exterior envelope, so you've got to put the, the ballot, the instructions, any affidavits, the ballot itself, and then the return envelope all goes in that big envelope. So the machine you'll see in a second, the inserter, does all that and automates the process. On that exterior envelope, you, we have you know, their name, the barcodes, and one extra thing, uh, level of security we added for this election is we now have an additional tracking system to track the intelligent mail barcode, which shows when the, so we knew when the ballot left here, we obviously knew when it came back, but the IMB helps us know when that ballot went to the other post offices along the way. So if it leaves here, goes to the Geneva post office, if it's mailed to someone in Elgin, it's gonna to get to the Elgin post office, then to their house, then back to Elgin, then back to Geneva, then back here. So this, with this IMB tracking, we have that end-to-end -end or Amazon style tracking. Mr. Sergis brought up the, the issue in the past. I know, Cliff, you've said, you know, you were concerned about when someone puts that ballot back in um, because the law allows someone to return a ballot as long as it's postmarked by election day. And sometimes ballots don't get postmarked. So you know, state law says, look at the affidavit. Through the IMB, we're going to know when it got to the, we'll call it the first post office. So if we're going to you, I don't know what post office goes to, but it, it'll come to, you know, somewhere up there. If it comes back within, you know, a day or two of the election, then it probably was dropped on election day and got here. If it hits the first post office a week later, then it probably didn't get postmarked on election day. So, um, to answer your question and to address um, some of the other issues, um, that's another layer of security that's going to let us know when those ballots were in fact mailed. Um, like we said, the postage is marked on the envelope, um, the ballots mailed to the voter, and through our ballot track system, the voter can track the process. Tracking instills confidence in the voters and gives us another layer of security to know where things are. Obviously, U.S. Post Office is out of our hands, but it's the process. So this is the sorter. I'm sorry, this is the inserter. All of those little, where it looks those levers coming up, those are the slots where things are inserted. So the ballot, the affidavits, the return envelope, et cetera, they go through and instead of doing them manually and taking minutes at a time to fold everything through the assembly line and do it, this thing does hundreds in a minute. So it automates the process. It, like I said, it assembles hundreds rather than several, it's hundreds a minute versus several an hour. Um, if you, the, the barcoding, like we talked about, increases voter confidence. There's a quality control side to it. So every certain amount of the envelopes will, will 
come through, drop out, and then we verify to make sure that they have everything on there that is supposed to be there. It weighs them. Uh, it looks for the so if something were missing, if a you know a, a form were missing, it would no, it'd catch that the weight is not uniform, so something's wrong. Something's not in it. And that's part of the quality control process. Uh, again, in terms of uh, savings to taxpayers, we calculated from the general election, instead of doing four an hour, we were doing thousands an hour. Um, you know, the machine more than paid for itself just in the first use of it. Uh, and ballots, uh, military ballots went out last week. Um, and now we're in the uh, early voting and vote by all time. So this is cute. Thank you, Blair. If you could hit that. This is just a, a quick grainy cell phone video of the process. So the ballots are being folded, going through the folding machine. Then they'll come out. They're taken over to the sorter. Now you kind of see the sorter. Obviously, it's preloaded. You're going to see the process as all of those packets get put together, assembled. It's going to go through the inserter. And then come out, folded sealed, stamped, that way. So that's step one. Step two, this is the step that you're probably most familiar with. This is what the voter actually does. The voters requested the ballot now, now the ballot comes. So the ballot's delivered to their house. The voter fills out the ballot, folds it, puts it back in the envelope, signs the certification on the back of the envelope, and then it returns it to the clerk's office. And so there are several ways to do that. They can stick it back in the mail. They can put it one of, they can drop it at one of these three secure drop boxes. So the three drop boxes are in the lobby of the clerk's office, in the lobby of the clerk's office in Aurora, and then at City Hall in Elgin. Uh, all three drop boxes have cameras. All three drop boxes are open and available only during business hours. So you're not gonna come and do it when no one's there. So they are secured. Um, you can come and drop it in person at the clerk's office and on the box, and people can drop it off uh, at an early voting or an election day voting site to the judges. So then the ballots come back to uh, the elections office through the mail or through whatever um, way they the voter chose to do it. And then, as we talked about earlier, the voter can track their ballot through our ballot tracking system. Step three. So now, this will be the yellow. To that here. So now the ballot, we're going to hold the questions to the end. end. So <laughs> the ballots have, are now coming back to the office. So the first stop will be the mailroom. So when the ballots get to the mailroom, a team of Democratic and Republican judges and their fancy vests will go to the mailroom to meet the mail and then bring it down to the clerk's office. So once it's in our, from the time it comes in our possession, there are Democratic and Republican judges there with it the whole time. They come down, again, everything is in the, the, the team, the bipartisan teams as we're calling them, work in tandem to make sure that all these safeguards are met and they will use our, what we call the ballot control log. So in addition to everything being logged digitally through the machines and going into our voter registration database, we also have good old fashioned paper too. So the judges log everything on the paper and they sign off on them. So things should match. So the first thing they're gonna do is when that tray comes in, they're gonna to look to make sure, see if there's any, any ballots that came back that were undeliverable, damaged, anything that's not gonna run through the system. And then sometimes the post office sticks labels on things or pieces of paper and staples, they'll, they'll take those apart so that when it comes down to the, the, the processing room, the envelopes will be ready to run through the system. So the ideal is that in this, on the same day when the mail comes in right afterwards, they're gonna get started on processing everything. If we have another election like we had in 2020 where we've got two mail deliveries a day and we're running things constantly, sometimes things may have to wait in the meantime. So anytime that those ballots are in our possession and they're not being processed, tabulated, verified, whatever it is, they're locked. They're locked in the container. Those containers have seals. Those seals have numbers. Anytime those seals are broken, the two judges are there and they're going to sign off on them and the numbers recorded. 
So if this box comes in and it has seal number one on it, on that log, it's going to say seal number one had the delivery at whatever so-and-so time on so-and-so date. It's then put in a secure room. If it's not being processed right away, it's being processed right away, we go through the process. Let's say there's a delay for some reason where judges are working on something else, then the, the two judges will go to the secure room, the vault, they'll sign off that they went in there, they're going to bring it out, they're going to open up that box, they're going to take off the seal, they're going to report that they open the seal, and they're going to record, and on the, the log is going to show that that was done. So anytime ballots are being touched, judges are there, anytime ballots are not being worked on, they're sealed, the seal's locked, the seal's recorded. So when they're ready to start, they're going to open up that box. They're going to be put into the to be processed area and they're going to be ready to go into the sorter. So they're, the sorting machine, the sorter, whatever we call it, they're put there and they're ready to go through for the first pass. Again, if you haven't been over to the office, check it out. When the siren goes off, it's like when the, the luggage rack starts at the airport, the noise goes off and machine starts working, the, the um, envelopes go through the sorter. So on what we call the first pass, they're going to go through to weed out the ones that aren't readable, whether they're damaged, whether there's something there. Very few come that way. Most of them are in good shape. So they're going to go through. And in that first pass, the, the machine at a rapid pace is going to take a picture of the signature, scan that signature, which we'll get to in a second, and then it's going to date stamp when that ballot envelope was received in the office. And that gets logged into our voter registration database so that we know, okay, Brian requested the vote by mail ballot. It was returned to the office on June 1st. It was received here, logged in. The signature was scanned that the judges are gonna verify in a minute. And the ballot came in at that point. So in the voter registration database, it's gonna show I already returned my ballot. So I can't go and vote another way because it's already been logged in that I've returned my ballot. So that separates the good versus not good. Just an easy way of looking at it. So um, for those envelopes that are good, don't have any issues from the physical standpoint, those signatures are then, like I said, scanned and they're exported for verification. So that's the sorter would be to the left side of that. As it runs through the sorter, they're gonna go into those, their packets that are at the end of the sorter. When they're taken out of those packets, they're gonna move over to the, um, we have basically the same level of um, packets on the other side. So they're just gonna be moved across while we're waiting for them to be, signatures to be verified and go through the second level of, um, a pass. But like I said, those signatures um, are exported for verification. Step four is the verification. So after um, it, the envelope goes through the first pass at a separate station, the signature verification station, you have a team of Democratic and Republican judges that are going to verify every signature. It's not a computer verifying it, it's, it's humans a bipartisan team that reviews every signature. So as I said, those signatures are exported from the sorter's computer to our voter registration database. Those envelopes are scanned and preserved. And then the team of Democratic and Republican judges that verify the signatures begin their work. So they sit together, have a big screen. On one side of the screen, you have the signature that was captured from the envelope. On the other side of the screen, you have this voter signature from our voter registration database. It's up to the judges then to make the decision. Does the signature match? Have they completed the verification and confirmed the signature? Are they challenging the signature or is there no signature? So obviously if there's no signature, it can't be verified. So then that voter will be contacted to let them know you sent a ballot in, but you didn't sign the envelope. We can't verify your signature. If you want to vote by mail, you have to come and verify your signature. Come identify who you are, show us that 
sign it, show us that your signature matches, and we'll count it. So a voter is informed and has the opportunity to cure that problem. Same with if the signature doesn't match. The voter is contacted and told, the judges went through the process, the signature doesn't match. If you, if you did sign this, if you are who you are, come to the office, verify who you are, present your identification, and show us you know, your signature and tell us that you did this, okay, that's fine. In most cases, just it's a similar process to actually in-person voting on election day. When you go show up to vote, an election judge, when you sign, will check your signature, same thing, except you don't have a no signature. Either it, it's verified or it's not. And if your signature is challenged um, at the polling place, you have an opportunity to present ID and show you are who you are. This is just the same process, but through the vote by mail process. For the vast majority, the signatures are verified by the judges, and then they'll move on to the next step. Those signatures will go back through, they'll be logged into the voter registration database as verified, and that report will go back to uh, the other room where they'll run it through the sorter again. We'll get to that step in a second. Um, judges sign off on the complete report, whether the, the signatures matched, didn't match, or, or no signatures. So all those numbers match. If 100, they were reviewing 100 ballots, that report should show that 100 signatures were examined one way and whatever the um, outcomes are. All of our signature verification judges go through um, training from a handwriting expert. Uh, it's a multi-hour training course. I'm not gonna go through all the slides. I'm gonna show you a few of them um, to show some of the things they look at. Overall, they're looking at just generally signatures in general, the theories of signature analysis, um, how signatures change over time, how signatures change with medical conditions, um, things to look at to see what, whether signatures are genuine or not. Here's an example. Um, President Nixon's signature changing from 1968 to 1974. Same person, just signatures evolve over time. And those are things that the judges are gonna have to look at. If the specimen signature is the 1968 signature and the 1974 signature is on the back of the envelope, is that a match? Well, that's what the training class helps to do. Then also looking, another thing, looking at slopes, looking at the way people write. Again, these are things, these are part of the training that the judges are gonna get. So the ballots now, gone through the first pass of the sorter, the signature was captured, the signature has been reviewed by a bipartisan team of judges. Now that envelope is going to go through a second pass. You'll see yellow again because step three and step five involve the sorter, so they're going to both be done that same section. So people that are, are uh, in to view the process, observers will see, okay, this is the yellow section, these are things that are going on. One thing I didn't uh, mention, for those that come over to um, the clerk's office, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it later, but we'll have um, a liaison to explain the process to the observers. So you can see, hey, this is the yellow section, uh, whether we give them, we have a smaller version of the flow chart. You can see here are the steps that are going on in the yellow section. If you're, if you're um, watching it, you'll see these are the things to, to look forward to. If you have any questions, here we have someone, an election judge can explain this process to you. So uh, we're getting ready to go through the second pass now because it's gone through the first time to capture the signature. Now we want to sort them by precinct. So that envelope is going to go through the sorter for a second time. Um, we have that, the report from the election judges that verify the signatures, which ones are good or which ones are bad. So the sorter is going to pop through the good ones into the good pile and then have them sorted by precinct. And the ones that were rejected because there was no signature or the signatures didn't match, we're going to go into a separate packet. Uh, when I say packet, they're little slots on the side of the machine. So the good ones will be ready to move to the next step. The ones that were challenged or had no signature will be put into a separate pile. And then, like we said, the voter will be contacted to have the opportunity to cure. On to step six, the opening and inspection of the ballots. So keep in mind here, we've gone through five steps already. This is the first time that the actual envelope's gonna be opened. So we spent two thirds of this process verifying and going through these security steps 
to make sure that the voters registered, that the voter actually applied for the ballot, that the signature matches before we open anything. So by the time you get to this process, you've had several layers of verification to make sure that this ballot should have made it to this process and should be opened. Because we're not gonna open a ballot if the person's not registered, the signatures don't match, et cetera. So at that point, uh, the ballots will then go to the extraction machine. And so this uh, extraction machine cuts off, opens the top of the envelope, and then the next step is the ballot pops up so that the election judge can remove or extract the ballot from the envelope. Keep in mind at that point, it's still folded. So we have the principle of a secret ballot in this country so that the judge that is using the extractor through that machine where it cuts it, that theoretically could see the envelope and see the voter's name. When that envelope, when the ballot is, when the envelope is opened and the ballot pops out, it's folded. The judge that unfolds the ballot is not the same judge that is at the extractor. So that judge is not going to have an opportunity, even if he or she wanted to, to see the actual votes on that ballot. At this point, the ballot is, is separated from the envelope. So the next team of judges will unfold it and get it ready for processing, doesn't see the envelope. So your, the secrecy of your ballot is preserved at that point when, those, um, when the ballot's separated from the envelope. So um, sometimes in the uh, envelope, there's an affidavit of assistance for a, a voter who needed help filling out the ballot. Um, the affidavit uh, is then separated from the ballot. Uh, I'll go with the other data or the other, um, the other forms. But at that point, the separation exists and then the ballots are placed into the tray. Um, they're, they're sorted by precinct and then they're ready to go to the next step of the process. Brian, just so we're calibrating our time, mm -hmm. are you like halfway through just about through or are we just getting started? Um, we're probably about two thirds through. That's the extractor. Um, so then the judges are going to unfold the ballots. You're gonna look at them and see, is it is the ballot able to be scanned? Has it been mutilated, torn? Is there a giant coffee stain on it? Is it wet, whatever? Can it go through the process? If it is, it's a good ballot. If it's not, it's we're gonna have to do something with it. If, because imagine that scanner, um, it can only read ballots that are able to be scanned and of the same format. So if the ballot's good and it's ready to go, it's gonna be processed. If it's damaged, if it's in another form, um, quick note here is, Military ballots, um, state and federal law allows a, a voter that's a member of the armed forces or an overseas uh, resident to use what we'll call a non-standard ballot that allows uh, an electronic transmission of the ballot. So when that comes in, obviously it can't be scanned because it's not of the same size as the regular ballot. A team of Democratic and Republican judges will replicate that ballot so it can be scanned. But just so you understand, that scanner can only read a ballot that was made in our office. It goes by the weight of the paper. It goes by the style. If it's off, it won't read it. So the idea that someone could make ballots on their own and try to send it back, not the same weight, not the, same, the watermark's not there, not the same size, font's not the same, the... the the scanner's not gonna see where the, the marks are at the same spot, won't read it. So another um, security measure. Step seven, tabulation. You call it tabulation, call it processing. Understand that um, the, the tabulation isn't done, the actual count isn't done until after the polls are closed on election night. But the processing of it being scanned, we can scan them and have them ready to go. No one knows what the marks on the ballot say. They're not counted. No one knows how many votes for each race someone got. All we know is that X amount of ballots have gone through the process, been verified, and been scanned in. Only after 7 o'clock on election night do we know how those votes are cast. In that secure tabulation room, nothing's connected to the internet. Um, everything is done um, 
through that system in that room and on, um, on cards so that nothing is broadcast over the internet. As we said, um, if you remember 2020, um, thanks to the automated system, we were able to have about 80,000 of the vote by mail ballots that had come in prior to election day or on election day already verified, scanned, and ready to go. So that at 7.15, uh, when that first wave came up, you saw 80 some thousand vote by mail ballots plus the 101,000 early votes that had been cast. So you saw about 80% of the votes because that was the, the ratio that came in prior to election day. Those things were all up. When other counties were still trying to open envelopes, trying to process things, counting their votes overnight through the next weekend, we were already done. You want accuracy, you also want speed. <laughs> so we went through this process, they're gonna go through Democratic and Republican judges at every step of the process, they get scanned, they're held until election night when they're tabulated. Last step is storage. As I said before, anytime ballots are not being used or actively done, actively touched, they're in a secure container. The secure container has a seal, the seal is numbered, it's locked and recorded. When the ballots go through the, the entire process, you're gonna see all the logs that went with it, the, the, the paper uh, reports of everything, and that they will go into the secured vault to be held. Um, I guess on time, there's a, there's a video that I kind of wanted you guys to see, but Blair, if you just want to send it out in the chat later or send it out to the board members if we're running short on time. It's, it's a video that NBC News did from 2020. It, it's a nice overview of the process to see how end-to-end -end it goes. Um, but if you come to our office, you can see the same thing. So as we've said, you know, we've taken election security very seriously. It's the clerk's office's goal to be the most transparent and secure election authority in Illinois. Um, we've talked about the color coding so that when you as an observer can see what's happening, you see you're, you're in the yellow section, you're in the orange section, you're in the purple section, that's what's happening. Here are the steps we've told you what should be happening and make sure it's happening the way it's supposed to be happening. Make sure there are two judges there, at least two judges there for each step of the process. We have cameras focused on each section, as we said. Here was uh, the uh, cameras being installed at several areas through the ballot room. Here's one of the views of all the cameras. Um, there are screens that are up in the office for observers. So if the room is filled to capacity, then a voter, or I'm sorry, an observer can be out at one of the screens looking at all of the camera monitors to see what's happening at all those sections. So if you can't, if you can't be in the yellow section and you want to see what's going on, you can be in the room or with other observers and see, okay, that's the yellow section, that's the blue section, that's the whatever section, or you can be there as you wish. A couple of principles of this process, the bipartisan chain of custody. At every point, there's a Democratic and Republican judge together. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, ballots can only be accepted and be in our custody and only come through from the mail prop from the time they come into our office to the time they're uh, stored with a Democratic or Republican judge. The seals are there. We talked about that. Bipartisan team does the signature comparison. We talked about the locks and seals. That's an example of what the seal looks like. They're on there. They're numbered. When they're opened, they're recorded. They're put in a log so we know who was there and what happened. The paper documentation we talked about, these are those logs that people are gonna you know, sign and verify and put the numbers on and all that stuff. It's kept in the system. It's also digitally, it's also on paper. <laughs> we encourage observers to come. The office is open. Please feel free to come on over, elected officials as well as the public. Um, what, if the room's, like we said, if the room's full, you can look at the, the camera views on the big screens. We want our observers to be aware of the process. That's why we'll have the election judge liaison there to answer questions or explain anything so people know what they're seeing. Nothing's hidden. It's all there for you. As we said, we have different levels of security. We have electronic. We have paper. We have um, some of those. We've, we've gone through all these safeguards. Um, and then um, a sheriff's deputy will also be there in case of any issues that come up. Um, Following the rules is important. 
It's important, obviously, to make sure the election goes the way it should. It's also important to instill confidence in the voters to know that, you know, the staff is doing what they're supposed to do, the election judge is doing what they're supposed to do, and you have, this is really an election judge driven process. That's why they're there at every step of the process. Our staff is there to assist and do some of the technical things, but the judges are the ones handling the ballots. And in order to have that confidence from the voters, you know that you have a Democrat and a Republican there for every step of the process. So that's kind of the overview. Are there, uh, thank you very much, Brian. Are there any questions? Seeing none. <laughs> Cliff, please go ahead. I'm so sorry. Brian, thank you so much. And, and John, thank you. You've come out to other groups and, uh, and you did such a better job than Brian. Did just say. <laughs> um, but but my, I do have a, a series of questions, that, uh, one or two that may not be specific to this, but you mentioned early voting starts today. So I went to the site to say, where can I early vote? It's only here in Aurora, correct? correct. Okay. It's, it's, the site would be great if there was like, you can click on that button and it would like Google map you right there. That would be a cool thing. Um, you mentioned that everybody received in the mail their voter cards, as did two of my children that no longer live in Illinois. What is the process for those people, or do they get to vote in Texas, Florida, and Illinois? Well, we've we put out a press release. We've we've tried to inform the public. If we don't know that they moved, obviously, if the person has passed away in King County, we know because we have the death certificate okay. and they're removed. But if someone moves and we don't know, it's incumbent on the person who receives that to send it back to us. Because it, we, we have first class postage on there, so it does get returned. We ask that you write, so and so no longer resides here and sends it back to us. Then we know that the person doesn't live there. You think mom and dad can do that for kids that have moved? Yes. Can we do it for seniors that have moved? You're, you're informing us. You know Perfect. what's going on. Okay. It, it's obviously best if the voter tells us, but if the voter hasn't told us, we don't know otherwise. If the voter is registered in another state, that's part of the collective to let us know. We know, but you know, perfect. There are some things that go through that we rely on you. Okay. On the IMB bar, mm -hmm. um, I appreciate. It's like we backed up the truck to, to answer my specific question that I've asked of John as well. I the on the IMB code. Is that giving us the data when the item was sent? It's not giving us the data of when it was returned. No, we know when it was sent because our system logs when the ballot was created. Correct. So we know that. The IMB will tell us, okay, we'll use the example again. It goes from here. It's going to go to the Geneva Post Office. So the IMB is going to tell us when it hits that post office. Let, let me be specific. Voting has ended. You have 10 days to get it in. 14. 14 days. How do you know when that was sent in? Because we're going to know when it hits that first post office. The IMB codes are read at the post office. So it's going to leave my, if, if I postmark, if, if I'm dropping it to the post office on election day, I'm going to go to the Aurora Post Office or I'm going to go to somewhere else, whatever. Post, Gilbert's me. Post Office. Okay, I'm going to go to the Gilbert's Post Office. Okay. And when, it, when it's processed there, that IMB is going to be logged and we're going to know when it hit that post office. So it's like a return mm -hmm. date stamp on there. And yes. that was not available in years past, but is now. Yes. Okay. Because again, the, the, you know, I, my, my, my complaint, my issue, my concern has always been, it seems like in those 14 days, that's a whole lot of time to get something from West Dundee to Geneva. Voting was meant to stop on such and such date. Construction traffic. Yeah, if you, if you are, if you, if all of a sudden those things are still lingering in 14 days later, you didn't end. And that's opens a different debate on, well, are you saying my vote shouldn't be cast? 
No, I'm saying your vote should have been cast by the deadline it was expected to be. Yeah, we we follow know. what the legislature says yep. in the election code. That was what it said. This was a, another safeguard that allows that we can do to help verify that question that you had. So uh, I'm sorry, use the please use the microphone. But but if it, but if it's it's allowed to be mailed up to 14 days later, no, 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 no. It has to be received received 14 days. 14 days later, postmarked by election day. So if you had a hundred or a thousand or a million that came in, you could challenge those and say no. You didn't because that barcode thingy is on there now, the IBIMB code that wasn't there in years past. Correct. Technology is catching up. Woo! Thank you, Madam Chair. Ryan, in here we go. In some states, uh, they have restrictions on who can actually mail or post or bring a mail vote by mail ballot to the election site um, or post it in the mail. Uh, and it's kind of fondly called by some people, ballot harvesting. Um, can you explain how that works here in Illinois? Because I believe that is not the case. So if I have a sick parent, I can uh, get their vote by mail ballot and post it in the mail for them. Good morning, Raymond. Good morning. So in Illinois, uh, so someone can bring in someone else's ballot, but we have an affidavit that the state uh, is required. So the person that belongs to that ballot has to sign it, and the person who's bringing it, and they're signing an affidavit that that's the person they allow. But a person like yourself, you can just bring it in. But in the post office, I mean, so, so Cliff can take his grandmother's vote by mail ballot, say thank you, Mrs. Whomever or, or Susan, and bring it to the mailbox and put it in without him breaking the law. Yeah, in the post office, I mean, that's, but if you're bringing it to our office in person, you have to sign that affidavit. But Cliff would never do that. Why not? Don't you want to help your grandmother yeah. out? <laughs> you. Help your grandmother. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Brown speaking. I, I don't have a question. I just want to say that this was a great presentation. And Mr. Chair, I hope maybe you can get Kane County Connects to post this video on there for the public to see and maybe even get um, our public information officer to put a press release out <laughs> that the clerk's office gave this presentation to the committee today and that the video is available by clicking this link. I Great suggestion. Be. And in addition to that, the clerk's office is uh, also available to make this presentation to organizations. So if an organization would like to have the presentation, uh, I know one is scheduled for the end of this month. I'm not sure what others might be scheduled, but if, uh, if you were a Kiwanis or a Lions or, you know, League of Women Voters or whatever it is group that would have interest in this, they would be happy to entertain the opportunity uh, to put this presentation on for your group. That's good. Kopi, please. Mr. Kopi. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, the phone blinked out there for a minute. I don't know if you covered this or not, but uh, in regards to the provisional ballots, I understand that there were provisional ballots cast, but they weren't counted and zero provisional ballots counted. And, uh, and you've uh, reflected uh, and cited uh, state statutes uh, in regards to um, the operations. I believe that is a, I believe that is a, uh, a legal standard to provide provisional ballots. Then the other question was, uh, um, um oh my got the other question oh um at what point is a ballot rejected and uh, there's been some wild accusation that there's been a zero rejection rate in regards to i believe the mail-in ballots in particular and uh whereas some counties are uh showing a rejection rate four five six percent 
uh, across the state and uh, typically across the nation that uh, for uh, uh, states that offer mail ballots, um, uh, whereas King County um, experienced zero. So we have two very, very fundamental questions, and uh, these are not wild accusations. This is fact, and um, the, this is this is the this is the impetus of why the people have come to the meetings in arms. And um, my job to ask those questions, and I'm asking them again now. And uh, has there been reparation? On, on on those issues, and a reason why it is extremely critical question is that uh, in the past elections, uh, so there's been very close county county board races that could have been influenced by the rejection rate one and the uh, um, um, uh, and the other question. So thank you very much. May, may, may I Sorry. summarize your questions? One, you wanted to know uh, about provisional ballots, which was not covered on this presentation, but the question associated with the process of provisional ballots. And second is you wanted to know the rejection process for what kind of ballots or ballots under what condition? I didn't understand. Yes, that, that's, that's a close summarization. Uh, in particular, why were there zero rejection rate and why was there no provisional ballots uh, uh, counted when I know that they were cast? Okay, I guess if, if you're talking about rejection of a vote by mail ballot, there were 164 that were rejected, meaning that they came through and they weren't counted. Mm -hmm. So I, that's a non-zero number. Um, with, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, percentage Re right. Rejection uh, would be the vote yeah. by mail ones. And then regarding a provisional. But, and when they're rejected, the voter is contacted, correct? Right. It went through the curing okay. process. Like we said, if there's, there's no signature or if a signature doesn't match or whatever it is, the voters contacted of that number, the 164 either didn't come to cure it or couldn't provide identification to cure it. Uh, then your other question was about provisional ballots and has been previously explained, and I'm going to try to answer this one. Okay. Provisional ballots really didn't happen in Kane County because you have the capability of same day registration. And you can do same day registration at the voting site, okay, on election day. So therefore the individual does not have to come into uh, Geneva to cast a provisional ballot. So that's why in Kane County, there were no provisional ballots cast. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Correct. Okay. So that the voter has the option. You if you're not in the voter rolls and you want to vote, you could either do a provisional, then have to come to the clerk's office, make a trip, bring your ID, do that, or present your ID, change your registration, or register and vote right then and there. The ballot's counted, it's cast, versus a temporary ballot where you have to come and prove your identification when you already have it with you. It's the voter's choice. If the voter chooses to do a provisional, it's up to the voter. Voters in Kane County over the years have taken advantage of the same day registration option to actually cast a ballot rather than casting a provisional. Did that answer your question, respect. Mr. Copey? Um, somewhat. Um, uh, all due respect, but uh, the uh, your, your narrative of my question is a little bit different than what uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that the rejection rate is a rate across the entire county of how many votes there were. And when you say there were 164 votes rejected, that's uh, for all practical purposes, that is a zero rejection rate, comparatively speaking. But let's not call it zero. Let's call it 0 .01, 0 0.02, whatever the number is. Um, it's uh, essentially zero, and it is it is cause for consternation. And um, and so. So I'm, I'm just saying it, it wasn't it wasn't spoken 
and it was and it is the core of the issue of the uh, consternation throughout the county. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Ms. Gums. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just speaking to Mr. Kopey's concern, I, I just try to understand it. Um, the suggestion that there's a zero rejection rate does not, in my opinion, include the, when, when it's rejected, it's sent back to the voter to correct or cure. So I think the statement that a ballot is rejected outright and can affect um, some things, maybe I'm getting in the Tom Kopey mode here, but I'm not saying it properly. Um, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what you're trying to say. But I would argue that the rejection is initial, but then it's cured. So it's, it's corrected or has the ability to be corrected. Is, am I confusing that with you, Mr. Kopey? I don't know exactly uh, at, at, at what point a particular ballot is considered rejected. Okay, I'll be honest with you. But the fact is that that other counties experience a, 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 a much, much, much higher and, and um, uh, potentially um, uh, potentially influential um, rate of, of ballots rejected that will sway election. And um, uh, now, whether or not those 160 were rejected on ballots that were corrected, uh, it, it, if all the other ballots were corrected, then um, then then I would I would have to not direct the question to our county clerk, and uh, perhaps his his operation is uh, is is nearly one hundred percent accurate. So that's that's the uh, that's that's the issue we're dealing with. Is how is it that all the other counties across the state uh, uh, experience a rejection rate, and how you qualify that rejection? Is I don't I don't know exactly, okay, and I apologize. I don't know that exactly. Thank you. Wait, no, I, thank thank you for that, Mr. Copey. I just wanted to wrap my mind around that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We we appreciate the comments, but one of the things that I do is I brag about Kane County. When you look at some of the statistics uh, earlier in the presentation, it said that the primary voting was accomplished and released by 715, 15 minutes after the polls closed. The majority of the numbers were available and online. Uh, I think that's phenomenal when you look at counties near us that uh, took uh, a day or two in order to come up with a good count. So I think we're in great shape. All right, thank you very much.